This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by ICANN, award-winning designer, manufacturer, and distributor of professional video, film, and broadcast production equipment. And by Blackmagic Design, creating the world's highest quality solutions for feature film, post-production, and television broadcast industries. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. In the green screen history lesson, I talked about the processes filmmakers have used to make traveling mats. In this lesson, I'll dive into the necessary elements you'll need to pull off a great chroma key. The first element in pulling off a key is the type of space you have to work with. Your space will determine what kind of chroma key shot is possible. When shooting against a green screen or a blue screen, you'll want to pull your subject away from the background far enough so that the shadows don't fall on the screen and you minimize the reflection of the screen on your subject. Now with smaller spaces, you should be able to pull off a reasonable talking head shot. That's a shot that's just the head and the shoulders speaking. For a full body shot, you're not only going to need a larger space for the screen, but also some distance to put your camera so your subject looks natural and isn't distorted by a wide angle lens. A shooting outdoors is also a possibility, especially for certain shots. Just keep in mind you'll have to deal with all the issues that come with shooting outdoors, including wind, noise, and shadows. The first question you're going to ask is green or blue? A blue screen is a traditional color for film, and it's still used today in many productions, but green is the preferred color for digital. Why? Because many digital cameras use what's called a Bayer pattern of red, green, blue photosites, where there are twice as many green photosites as there are red and blue. This makes digital cameras much more sensitive to green part of the spectrum. Green screen also requires a lot less light than blue screen and is less likely to match the clothing of your actors. Now still you may want to use blue screen in certain cases, say you're shooting a green monster. In fact on Sam Raimi's Spider-Man the green goblin had to be photographed on blue screen because his suit would have been lost on a green screen. Spider-Man on the other hand had to be shot on a green screen because his suit was red and blue. Now when it comes to the material of your screen, you have several options. The first is to paint your background using chroma key paint. This is the most permanent and most labor intensive way to create a chroma key background, though it is certainly necessary if you are planning on installing a cyclorama. The other option is to hang your screen. You'll need background stands and clamps to hang your screen on. The screen itself can be made out of paper or muslin background cloth, but I prefer foam backed cloth because it scatters light more evenly and you can avoid hot spots and the foam keeps the screen from wrinkling when it's not in use. For smaller setups, foldable chroma key screens are available. These kits are really handy for quick portable setups for outdoor use and the built-in frame keeps the screen from getting too wrinkled. When lighting for chroma key, you have to think about lighting first for the screen and then for your subject. In tight situations, you can combine the lighting, but you could end up with shadows on the screen and that will make it a much more difficult task of pulling a good key. Start by focusing on getting clean and even lighting on your screen without your subject. Here I'm using two ICANN IDMX 1500B dual color fixtures, part of the ICANN five piece dual color chroma key kit. These are hung in front of the screen using a truss system. These are awesome LED lights that put out a lot of soft, even lighting, which is an absolute must for properly lighting a green screen. Now, if you're an avid DIYer, you may try to use long fluorescent tubes to light the screen. Another DIY option is the Hollywood strip lighting fixture. This is one I found on a street curb being thrown out and it made for a nice shadowless green screen light. To check the quality of the lighting on the green screen, I'm using the ICANN MD7's built-in waveform monitor. Notice the tight band. This means that the screen is evenly lit and there's not much variation of the lighting itself. You want to get this band as tight as possible, not slanted or having spikes which are the hot spots. 
Now, if you can't get your hands on a waveform monitor, you can use your camera zebra settings. Zebras tell you what part of your image is overexposed. If you lit your screen properly, you should see the entire screen, or at least a good chunk of it, turning into zebra stripes at the same time as you open up the iris to overexpose your shot. Once we have a well-lit screen, it's time to put our subject in place and work on the subject's lighting. Keep in mind the final composition and try to light your subject that will match the way your scene is going to look ultimately in the post-production. Now here I'm using the ICANN IB1000 LED lights, part of their chroma key kit. These lights can be set to 3200 degrees Kelvin, which will match great with the tungsten lights I already own. Just take care when lighting your subject to avoid casting shadows on the screen. When I first started experimenting with green screen, I was working in the DV format in standard definition, and you had to be exact in order to get an acceptable key. And even then, there were some funky artifacts. But I'm happy to say that with HD, getting reasonably acceptable keys is much easier because the pixels are so much smaller. But the type of compression that you use in the, the camera can be a detriment to the quality of your green screen. Now, most consumer cameras use a 4 to 0 compression for handling color. I talk more about color compression in the lesson on nonlinear editing if you want a refresher. In this demonstration, I'm using the Blackmagic Cinema Camera decked out with ICANN's Tilta Rig. The Blackmagic Cinema Camera is capable of recording in 422 compression using ProRes or DNX HD formats, or even recording a 444 uncompressed 12-bit RAW. Now, my tests have shown that compressed 422 is pretty good for pulling a good chroma key, but the RAW is simply unbeatable in terms of ease and quality. If you want the best chroma key, by all means, shoot RAW. Just know that it's expensive in terms of the amount of memory it eats up. I'm not saying you can't pull a decent key using anything less than 422 or RAW that the Blackmagic Cinema Camera can deliver, but a camera like this, with a compression or lack thereof, sure makes it a heck of a lot easier. Most basic keyers you find inside NLEs behave like hardware chroma keyers in that you'll most likely be totally let down by the results. But there are a lot of professional keying software solutions available out there that can help you pull a pretty good key even out of so-so footage. My favorite happens to be one that comes bundled inside Adobe After Effects called Keylight, made by The Foundry. This plugin is incredibly robust with all kinds of features like matte choking, spill removal, despotting, and even masks that help you fix little chroma key mistakes here and there. Plus, After Effects is just a good platform to be working in when you're doing your compositing. A key light is also available for purchase for other editing platforms. Now, if you can't pull a perfect key off of the entire frame, well, don't worry, as there is a technique called garbage matting. Using Adobe After Effects, we can create a rough mask around our subject and throw away all the other junk in the frame that's unimportant. This is a great way to work, especially if you have a smaller space. Just make sure that your subject doesn't cross into the garbage mat. Once you have a good, clean key, it's a matter of compositing the subject onto your background plate, adjusting the colors to match, and compositing foreground elements to really sell the effect. By considering your working space, using a quality screen, lighting it evenly, using a camera with as little compression as you can get your hands on, and finally using a good software keyer, you should be able to pull off a great key. Good chroma keying is a skill, and it takes a little bit of practice, but the reward for your patience and your experimentation can be quite liberating. It'll be another tool for you to use in your quest to make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.